I wanted, to, yeah, okay, I'll wait to. I wanted to again thank everybody uh, for coming. We have people from New York State, from California, from Texas, from uh, from many many places, Ohio, and many places. So thank you, and uh, uh, fifty right now, and I think there'll be more. Um, the uh, New Mexico uh, yesterday lost uh, a poet. A uh, damn good poet and a friend to many of us, uh, and, uh, Bob Warren, uh, R.B. Warren, uh, and his wife, uh, Barbara, both died of COVID-19. Uh, they lived uh, down in uh, Los Lunas, just south of Albuquerque. And um, his book, Litanies Not Adopted, from Swimming with Elephants Press, came out a couple of years ago. I think you could still get it. I know you can still get it through Bookworks. And um, it's, it's a tremendous book. And he was somebody that um, uh, spent much of his life working with the poor and with Habitat for Humanities and, um, for, and with other, other charities, a wonderful man. So uh, I just wanted to begin uh, by reading one short poem from Bob Warren from Litanies Not Adopted. And this is called The Sun. The sun is over the mountain and the warm early morning light points to the table where lately what work I do is done. Write something it says, anything. Mark the page disturb the whiteness of the sheet. Bring meaning to this less than chaos. Do something with years and space. This time, make use, make do, be used. Bob Warren. Yes. And thanks to Billy Brown, who also has been forwarding, and, and Bill Nevin's been forwarding poems by Bob. So, thanks. Um, so, uh, our first uh, featured poet, uh, Hilda Raz, uh, lives in Placidas and is currently series editor for poetry at the University of New Mexico Press. Uh, she had been the editor of Prairie Schooner, a well-known journal from, for many years. And um, she was the first uh, Lushai professor and editor in the Department of English at the University of Nebraska. She's also past president of the Association of Writers and Writing Programs, been a visiting writer at Stanford, uh, Pennsylvania State, uh, the University of Iowa, the University of Florida, too many schools to name, and uh, also worked in MFA programs uh, she's published 13 books as a poet, nonfiction writer, and editor. And her new book is called List and Story. I think she has it to hold up. And uh, uh, Sandy does. List and Story from Stephen F. Austin University Press, which is available through Bookworks and Amazon and so, and so forth. And she's also, I don't know how she does all of these things, uh, she's also... Um, on the board of directors of Arbor Farm Press. She's also the poetry editor for Bosque Literary Journal, which is a really nice uh, magazine that comes out of this area. And, uh, and she's a neighbor of ours. So please welcome Hilda Raz. Thank you so much, Jules and John. What a pleasure to be here with you all. Great. Liston's story is my new book, and we decided that I should read tonight only from Liston's story. What does the title mean? It signals surprise and obsession. I am absolutely in love with the catalog poem, the list, as well as the narrative poem, the story, where the, whereas the catalog poem with its lists invites the reader to make a story. The story poem or the narrative poem, to my way of thinking, closes it out. I love them both. They seem to speak to one another. 
I wanted to talk a little bit about collaboration. And the cover signals the first collaboration I wanted to mention, and that's with artist Karen Kunk. She's a brilliant internationally acclaimed uh, artist. And I asked for this piece in exchange for writing the catalog copy for a fine arts exhibit that, that she had. She had asked me to do that. So instead of paying, I bartered for this piece. So I've lived with it for many, many years. And part of me thinks that I actually wrote the book around the cover. Okay, let's go. In all my years of writing, I realized that I had not written a poem about my father. He was an interesting man who left school at 12 to start delivering groceries for his mother, who was a single parent, and she owned a grocery store. So this is the very first poem I'll read to you. It's on page eight for those of you who have the book in front of you. It's called Transportation. My father bought a wagon to deliver groceries, then the shoe store's leathers, the mercantile's piles of rugs and towels, or anything else those neighbors needed carried from one place to another. Then he got a truck, more trucks and a terminal building, a phone and a typewriter and billing pads, and put his mother to work in the front office with an adding machine, a gas pump, and a motto. We move everything but the world. He bought a Packard, broke his back doing some fool thing in the alley, married Dolly, pretty but helpless, and over years moved the family from Harvard Street behind the skating rink to Highland Heights, in spite of covenants against Negroes, Italians, and Jews. Nobody ever stopped him. Somehow money piled up enough to keep his widow and child for many years, until the fleet of trucks and buildings with his name and motto in rolled gold stopped, were shuttered sold. Where is he now? A sliver of bone and surge dug into a closed cemetery's dirt? Or reborn as some ambitious boy in Agra with a taxi ready to transport tourists and their stuff wherever they tell him to go or wherever he wants them to go? And here's a survivor carrying stories from one life to another. Yours, readers. So that's how I thought about this book and my role in it, transporting these poems, these lists and stories to you, the readers. John, I have a question because, oh, I'm now there's, I'm, playing with the views and I'm trying to get I've got John on the screen how do I get myself on the screen you're you're on the screen Hilda you're, now, on, you're on the screen for all of us yeah. okay I, I think it's on you it might not be that way but you're on it okay all right I can't locate myself so I can't see where I'm who to whom I'm speaking okay all right so, I, as you know, I'm a, a teacher as well as a writer, and I write and teach both poetry and memoir. The next poem is based on the gender dynamic in my own classroom in a course that was called Women and Poetry, and still is. My first time teaching that seminar, I was terrified, let me tell you. And then I had to write this poem. Of course I had to write this poem, which was also scary. The final couplet took a very long time for me to find. And it was only last year when Sigrid Munitz's National Book Award winning novel, The Friend, came out that I actually found the epigraph. 
So here, here's that poem. Okay, and I, huh. one needs to be uh, more technologically adept than I am. Uh, this poem is on page 19, Women and Poetry. Here's the epigraph. Among all my desires at the time, one of the strongest was to put my full trust in someone, in some man. They want to be told what's what by a man. Women at the north end of the table nodding together. One so newly married, she writes as if the poem is her writing hand, lonely for the ring. I wanted to be told what's lovely by a man, as I was by my famous teacher who taught women, especially the beauty seated on his right to incite riot. Her pain seemed an ars poetica, her poems all naked body, enticingly sensual, flushed in sun and shower, come from the pool in stanza one to become in stanza two an erect and threatening penis in a changing room shared by a man and a girl. Was she the child, we wondered? What difference to the poem? In my class, we sat together in a darkening room late afternoon. I am trying to love poetry as a stay against confusion. Flesh for now a stay against death as lightning, incipient storm with its causal gods, breaks closer to morning. And now I write alone in the kitchen with only that growl to push me. No man's voice here, no transformation, only poetry. In that gender war, <clears throat> poetry wins. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> that wonderful line, I'm trying to love poetry as a stay against confusion. I stole from Robert Frost. I give him I, the credit in the notes. I, I always acknowledge my thefts. <clears throat> okay, and here's another poem that's called April. In this poem, I decided to personify that spring month as an automaton. The one from actually the movie Blade Runner, movie I loved. You'll find women here too, placed among flowers, as used to be customary, to show that they're part of nature, the natural world, rather than culture, books, and learning. And here's April on page. 27. And pale blooms on trees poets sheltered among to become floral on their book jackets. We girls too stooped among lilacs for the camera to show we were nature. Photos of cousins among peach blossoms in the backyard were caught in a silver frame. Next, here we are too, posed among branches of magnolia, a nest. Did we forgive ourselves later, our skirts filled with scent as we crouched over the incense burner to get ready? Flower cups blooming on cactus as red as we were at the center. I never said I'd live among blooms for long, did I? In Blade Runner, he said, time to die, as he did, that beautiful automaton. I can never live through April without thinking of that movie. So beautiful and so created and so obsessed. Okay, I talked a little bit about collaboration and it's compelling for many writers, me included. In this book, one of my own collaborators is with, I'm sorry, one of my collaborations is with early tales. I love them. Talking with 
and back to their assumptions. The speaker in this poem may be the powerful old crone from Hansel and Gretel, and the other in the poem is that familiar lush and generative young woman we meet so many places in literature. This poem is called One Toe Crooked, and it's on page 28. One Toe Crooked. Let me tell you how it is with me. A bad back, spine like a snakeskin shed in the shadow of a pinelet, weakened innards, a liver fit for soup, and a brain the size of a lentil. The worst is the one toe, crooked like a staff carried too long by shepherds. One day, a fine mid, I'm sorry, let me start there. One day, a fine mid-autumn with sun's eye full open against air's chill, I took to the woods to find my dinner. What with one thing and another, I swayed and shimmered my way along the path, gravel stuck to my knee from a fall, my felt shoes catching stones. But still, I got to the gate where geese cross, coming home from the pond. What would do me that night? I was one only with an oven fit for a child with money, my prize. Each night I lit it with a faggot of willow and some wormwood leaves. It had an iron basket suspended over the fire, good for roasting corn and potatoes. Tonight, I was hungry against the chill coming. No ice yet, that was full winter, but for now a clutch of eggs to boil in the kettle. Truly then I saw a girl, lovely as a stalk of silver grain, come around a corner that an oak made with my barn wall. She carried a bundle, squirming like a peck of tadpoles and clutched to her chest a stack of books bound with a strap. She saw me as a wraith and ran. Was I a wraith? My toe hurt like hell itself gaped open, but ectoplasm I wasn't, plain flesh. Still, she was afraid. Then I could see her babe's mouth open, its cries louder with each bounce, the flannel it was bound with coming loose. As I watched, standing bent over my toe, she dropped the books. The belt around them opened. Pages fanned out on the ground like parchment put to flame. What did all this mean in the daylight? The girl, her babe, the lost books cascading, and over everything pain ascending, covering our light, all that hope, the future, somehow gone dark as a cavern. I bent over the mess, began to gather it up. That poem grew in my mind intact, absolutely intact. But in writing it, I became aware that the poem slowed down the poet. I wanted every detail to come from the crone's point of view. Is she imagining the girl? Is she a hallucination? Does the crone mean to gather up the baby and eat it, cooked in her marvelous stove? But contrary to stereotype, she gathers up the books, not the babe. Or does she? It's deliberately, am I'm sorry, it's deliberately ambiguous whether she will also gather up the babe who represents the future, of course, and nature, as opposed to culture, the books. Why? Well, I don't know, maybe to provide alternative mappings of life. We live, Jules and John and Dale and Hilda, in a magnificent place in New Mexico in Placitas. This poem looks out our back window. I wanted to slow down the lights, the lines, to approximate our wonder at seeing in snow such a sight. This is called a covey of scaled 
quail, page 38. Our first year here, a covey of scaled quail. The bedroom shade is half drawn. Snow interrupts the field. Cliffs of sand held together. Intermittent shrub and rock. We wait by the window, frame of a white falling, a rush of cold against which our breath moves. Now dark interrupts the snow. Under the juniper slowly, the odd bird scurrying, then two, then a group that vacates in ranks the dark under and goes into fog. Covey, many. Where has this covey come from? Dry air sucks up snow, then leaves what falls to stay a while, as we do, inhabitants of another intermittence. Footprints to discover at dawn as cold drops over the mountain, and we wake to watch another day. And here's the final poem in List and Story. It's another collaboration. Erin Raz Link, an artist, and I were commissioned to make a sculpture, Erin, and a poem based on the sculpture, me. His sculpture was a plexiglass cabinet on whose shelves were displayed a collection of lead objects the size of type and that resembled letters. Each one was separated in a small transparent space. And here's my poem to go with Erin's sculpture, Letters from a Lost Language, page 72. It too has an epigraph, this one from Jane Hirschfield. An alphabet's molecules, tasting of honey, Iron and salt cannot be counted. Our life in minerals, wrote the poet, to call up the patient sea. He stands on sand called shar, shore. Let me start again. Our life in minerals, wrote the poet, to call up the patient sea. He stands on sand called shore, salt, Mustache. The letters come, are caught, arranged, erase. Here then is my life in letters, a great weight, a metal alphabet meaning nothing one can decipher. Patience calls out the poet from the margins. One letter, like a chair, flexes toes. One is a sigh. I have tried all my life to carry weight from the margins to the center, one letter, then another, until the click of the box says stop. See the hasp of the lock on the transparent door? See the shadows? Is one a belt buckle? A woman swimming? One arm of a scissors? A chair? A man waving? A clown in a backbend, dog behind a bolt. Zzzz, says the guard in the box as he bows his pregnant belly behind Cocopelli to make an urn. Shadows move to ease light from the museum windows. Soon we will find the metal key. Again, the poet brushes salt into glowing shapes, and soon the fires will light, and we will return to mineral. Thank you so much for listening. I enjoyed being here with you all. Wow, Please. thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Jules. You're filling my screen. Wonderful. Can you unmute us, Jules?
I need everyone for applause. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you, Hilda. <laughs> Hold your book up again, Hilda. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Hilda. That was delightful, and uh, the information. Uh, for List and Story is in the chat if people want to order it, which I'm sure many will. So, Thank you. Perfect. So and I must say we love our quail here, both the snail quail and the gambles quail. And, uh, uh, gambles quail about two weeks ago, so that was fun. Yeah. Okay, so uh, good. Uh, Got a few more people coming in, which is yeah. Terrific. Thank you, and I put the book information on the chat, but it's um, List and Story by Hilda Ross. So support your local independent bookstore and available at Bookworks or and many other fine bookstores. Yeah. And <laughs> thank you for every. We are getting donations in already, so thank you so much and um, be supporting the poets and. Hilda's going to give her half to Bookworks in Albuquerque. So, cool. cool. Uh, so we're going to uh, move on to our next reader, uh, who is Nathan Brown. Uh, he's an author, songwriter, award-winning poet, uh, living in the hill country of Wimberley, Texas. And uh, Nathan holds a PhD in English and journalism from the University of Oklahoma where he taught for over 20 years, was Poet Laureate of the State of Oklahoma. And now, uh, living in Texas, also tra when, when, uh, when it's possible, he travels a lot, uh, reading, playing guitar, singing, uh, and doing workshops. And we've been fortunate that Nathan um, frequently would stop in New Mexico. We like, okay, summer's here because Nathan's here, right? And uh, uh, we, you know, he, he's done a couple of uh, workshops and readings for Jules Poetry Playhouse, both in Albuquerque and in Placidas, and also done a number of house concerts with, for uh, Scott Wiggerman and David Meishen, which are wonderful events. And um, anyway, uh, we, um, we were uh, hoping to have a whole weekend of so a whole weekend songwriting workshop with him in I think April, but unfortunately uh, things happened. But hopefully we'll be able to do that again. Uh, I, I should mention um, uh, he has about 21 books, including a recent travel memoir, just another honeymoon in France, um, a collection of poems called Karma Crisis. Uh, there was a finalist for the Patterson Poetry Prize and the Oklahoma Book Award. And uh, earlier book, Two Tables Over, won the 2009 Oklahoma Book Award. And also, uh, he has a CD of his own songs, which I highly recommend. Uh, it's called The Streets of San Miguel, and uh, that just came out last year. And uh, and that title, the, the title song is just just blows me away. So the, the streets of San Miguel. So anyway, without further ado, Nathan Brown, so glad you could be here. Hey, all right. Thanks for having me, John. I appreciate it very much. Uh, let's see, am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, all right. So <laughs> I appreciate it. And uh, John, I think, by the way, you just, you just gave the line from, you know, all things where, where poetry begins. And then things happened. <laughs> I think I think that's where all, all poetry begins. And then things happened, right? Yes. So, by the way, I just I do want to say thank you very quickly, uh, John and Jules, you guys, for what you do for poetry and how you keep things alive. Scott and David, you've been a huge part of life uh, in Austin and Albuquerque. You know, both. You're you're poetry stalwarts and I deeply appreciate it. And to my cousin, my cousin, uh, cousin 
Billy Brown. <laughs> Thank you for all you do, sir, as well. I, I do appreciate it. I'm going to read. So my book, my uh, my most recent book is the one they were mentioning, uh, Just Another Honeymoon in France. Uh, and um, this is the first book in a series of books that uh, will all carry the subtitle A Vagabond at Large. And I'm launching a new series of travel memoir books. Now, but in this book, two poems, uh, you know, I, I can't not write poetry. So even when I'm writing prose, <laughs> there's going to be a book, you know, there's going to be poems that spring up in that book. I want to read you just two quick poems from uh, the travel memoir, Just Another Honeymoon in France. The first one is called, May the Fromage Be With You. It begins with a quote from the movie, The Red Violin. My boy, play well, and there will be cheese. Violin, cheese. And on the eighth day, God said to the French, let there be cheese. He went on to say, and let there be cheeses of all colors, all kinds, from white to orange, even blue and green cheeses, hard cheese, soft cheese, from fragrant to noxious, from holy to moldy. And then God commanded that these cheeses go forth and multiply all throughout the homeland of the Gauls. And that mankind living in the land at that time should give names to all the cheeses, names that will be veritably unpronounceable to any living outside the land. Say Crotin de Chavignol or Neufchatel or maybe Chabichou de Poitou. Then in order for the French to be able to eat well all the days of their lives, God created the Fromagerie, a wondrous little shiny store devoted entirely to cheeses so the people of the land would always have a huge selection. And lo, the cheese will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. So that one came out in poetry form. <laughs> you know, how could you not write that, you know, about the French in poetry? Because, and the, the French appreciate uh, the poetry moments in the book. The second poem I want to read, this is a Paris poem. And the title of this is Poets, Pirates, and Painters. It begins with a quote from Baudelaire. And like an amorphous, like, and like an amorous whisper, the myriad music of life. Don't bend down too close to the ground here in Paris. All the dust, disappointments, and funereal unrests of its poets and pirates and painters, alive or dead now for centuries, will begin to whisper for you to come closer, then a little closer. There will be a secret they want to tell you. Céline said, the people in Paris always look busy when all they actually do is roam around from morning to night. If you put a hand over your eyes and stop gazing in the window of the Louvre or up at the Arc de Triomphe, you'll hear Cezanne muttering, we live in a rainbow of chaos. Or Monet's mournful lament, my life has been nothing but a failure. Baudelaire said, I speak of boredom, which with ready tears, dreams of hangings as it puffs its pipe. And the dust in the cracks of the Quai Voltaire, the monumental disappointment of Charles Baudelaire, even the insatiable unrest of a Paul Gauguin or Picasso's hand, are not trying to push you away. They do not want you to leave. They merely seek your permission to step on your rose-colored glasses and toss them into the river sink with a bow to common sense. Paris is the city of light that harbors many darknesses. Darkness is filled to the brim with such insufferable beauty. 
the reason so many of its songs are sad with love, its losses, and accordion tears. Thanks. And so, as per my tradition, cheers, everyone. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it's going to appear at some point. It's going to happen, right, hey, John? All right, there you go. <laughs> John, cans will do whatever you got. All right. Yeah. So, cheers, everybody. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for uh, tuning in. How fun. It's so fun to be in New Mexico. Mm. I miss it terribly, and especially this time of year. Um, when Texas happens to be a boiling witch's cauldron. And so uh, I do miss uh, the monsoon season. It's one of my favorite things in the whole world. So uh, I wish I could be there. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna read just a couple, a uh, few poems real quickly from uh, my most recent poetry collection. It's called 100 Years. And uh, this is a, a new, uh, a fairly new book for me. And what I did with this book was, I wrote a poem for every year of life. So I started with zero. There's a year before we are an age. We are not one until our first birthday. So there's a whole year where we're zero. And I go all the way up through the age of 100. And I alternate between fictional male and female characters. Uh, none of them are about me. And um, so each one is a little tiny act of fiction. And uh, I try to take on every age of life. I, I gave it my best shot. And so the first one I want to read you is a, a poem that I wrote for a 10-year-old girl. This has nothing to do with being a father of a daughter, okay? Now that I've made my disclaimer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> here we go. This is called The Flip of a Switch. Within days of turning 10, her right fist shot up to her right hip with the right elbow pulled notably forward. And it has not been seen to relax for one minute since. To go along with that, her eyes have taken to rolling upwards with the drama and force of a Titan's blazing chariot dragging the sun behind it. And since her voice is steadily rising in pitch and volume, everyone else in the house feels like a hostage now, all waiting nervously to see how this pans out. Okay, so um, that's for the 10-year-old girl. Now the next poem, I'm gonna jump way up um, in the age spectrum here. I'm gonna go to a 58-year-old man. Uh, and this is bo uh, based extraordinarily loosely on an old friend that I used to have who respected the poem and said, fine, go ahead and publish it. Just don't ever say my name. <laughs> okay, so that's where this one, this is titled Restraint for a 58-year-old man. He arrived to the 1960s sometime in the mid-70s and was late to everything else for the rest of his life. He'd gone to a small Baptist university because the drugs were better and being a hippie was still somewhat exotic. But when the last of many nailed him to a set of vows and in came that first child, out went the guitars, the tie-dye t-shirts, a Godspell fro. From there, he went slowly and carefully insane since up to that point, He'd been faking. He worked in some strange way for the government through a string of decades and four more children whom he loves dearly and devotedly. And now at 58, he's alone for a bit on his back porch, feet propped up to a sunset and a glass of red wine. And he's realizing for the first time he's accomplished at least one astonishing feat in his life. He is a serial killer who never acted on the impulse. Now you can see why he didn't want me to mention his name. <laughs> That's right. Okay. <laughs> so, but anyway, love you. 
you, you know who you are. All right, so the last one I'll read from this book, um, keeping an eye on the time here. I'm a recovering Baptist preacher's kid, so I watch the clock. Um, <laughs> we're all shell-shocked, you know, but <laughs> I used to give my dad, you know, the five-minute warning uh, when he was preaching, you know, when I was sitting on the front row or wherever I was, you know. So the, la the, uh, the, the last one from this book that I want to read is for a 70-year-old woman, and this is also based on a very dear friend. It's called Forward to the Past. So she moved to Santa Fe because LSD and mushrooms made more sense than iPhones. And she moved out here by herself because none of the men she loved had survived the late 1960s intact. And she remembers a few bad trips of her own, but nothing as scary as Bob Dylan's new Christmas album. So at 70, she got rid of everything but the cat and the car to put it in and drove to the Sangre de Cristos. It wasn't soon enough to do this, but it wasn't too late either. And now that she's here, the smell of pinon fires, all the indecipherable art up on Canyon Road, and the odd way people dress in this town just make her feel something like 19 again. So I'm always, I'm always careful about, <laughs> I'm always careful about reading uh, Santa Fe poems to Albuquerque people. Oh no, I used to be a Santa Fe person. <laughs> I love it. Well, the it. reason is, so my wonderful friend, and I miss him so dearly, the late Tony Mares, who was a, uh, an Albuquerque stalwart. And I, I miss Tony so much. I, did, I miss Tony so much. I, Tony Mares was a dear friend. I have to be honest and tell you, and any of you who knew Tony Mares would know why this is the case and that it is true. Uh, but Tony was just such a huge uh, factor in introducing me to New Mexico. And almost everyone I know in New Mexico is a result of the wonderful Tony Mares and his, his incredible generosity, taking me to readings with him and saying, Nathan, you need to read here. You, say, you know, people need to hear this. You need to come, you know, and I owe him so much. And I'm so sorry that, you know, we lost him lately. But I do, one of my favorite stories about Tony <laughs> is that we were, when we, I had read at, um, well, it was then the, the, uh, 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 Church of Beethoven is that what they used to call it and now it's right okay yeah and so I had just finished reading and we were sitting in a coffee shop and I was getting ready to leave and Tony looks at me over the top of his latte and he goes so you getting ready to go back to California <laughs> I, he, I was going to Santa Fe and that that was what Tony called Santa Fe <laughs> going back to California <laughs> so I love you Tony and uh, so, so what I'm going to do to close with I'm going to close with one poem here can I and, say one thing you'll like okay Santa Fe is to Albuquerque as Boulder is to Denver mm. <laughs> which which says something so totally different depending on what decade you're talking about you know, Boulder has just changed so drastically over the over the last few decades. You know, and it used to be this wonderful place, and I'm not saying that it isn't. And I'm, you know, I, I I continue to try to love Boulder, but a lot of Lincoln navigators in Boulder. And so, um, but I want to close with this poem and just tell the quick story of what it is that I'm up to right now. So, as John mentioned, um, I make my living as a as a wandering troubadour. Um, some people say, you know, uh, uh, a traveling troubadour. Some people say a bum poet, uh, you know, with no home. And so however you want to put it, that's great. But the fact of the matter is, the, tru the truth is, is that when March came along, um, I had the year of 2020 so booked solid. My, my calendar was loaded um, all the way through November and things were going so well and I was so excited about the year and about mid-March the lights began to go out on my career uh, 
it, it's how I make my living. I no longer teach at the university. I don't, you know, it's, I, this is how I make my living now. I do concerts, house concerts, poetry readings. I teach workshops. Uh, and the, by mid-April, it, it was... It was, as, it was as if Los Angeles had gone dark. You know, you were up there on the hill where the Hollywood sign is and looking down over LA and LA was dark. And that was my, uh, you know, the whole thing, it's gone. It's just gone. Around, uh, around sometime there in April, my wife had a couple of friends. They were doing a Zoom happy hour. And her two friends said, you know, Nathan ought to like commission, you know, tell people, like have people commission poems and they can just do a donation. It doesn't matter how small or how big, you know, have him write them a personalized poem and things like that. Well, uh, to, to go from there you know, to now, I can't even explain, uh, I can't explain what has happened. My gratitude is de deep and eternal and I, it's crazy. This turned it, this has turned into a COVID time. Uh, career. The the commissions and the donations, and by the way, I've told people I do not care if it's one dollar. I don't care if it's five dollars. I've had people give all the way from 15. Um, I have one lady who's commissioned five poems and has given me 800 five, uh, something. I don't know. And it's everything, you know, in between. I don't care. It doesn't matter. But you give me a theme or a topic and I will write you a poem. And those poems have now turned into a four book series. The first book in the series is due out actually within a couple of weeks. It's called In the Days of Our Seclusion. And it's a book of the uh, commissioned poems. Book two is already almost written. It ends at the end of August. Anyway, this has saved my life. And I wanted you to tell the story. I, I wanted to tell you the story of the miracle of I, it was so unexpected, and I'm, I'm so grateful, and it, it's been amazing, and, and it has also allowed me to connect with certain readers and certain people in my life in a way that I never would have been able to connect with uh, otherwise, and so now that my time is up, I'm going to read this one. It's a one half a page. It's a tiny poem, so don't be afraid. It's, it's okay. I'm just going to finish with this one, and this is a poem. This is a very recent poem, and this was written for The Wall of Moms in Portland, Oregon. Um, this was something that somebody had mentioned to me, and I went online and started researching and reading articles about it, and it just blew me away. I was like, yeah, it's always the moms. Moms have no fear. It's just, I, I love it so much, and everything that they have inspired. And so, anyway, I'll end with this, and thank you. By the way, Hilda, I loved your reading. Thank you very much. Uh, it was wonderful. Um, I appreciate that. And John and Jules, again, thank you for keeping it alive, figuring out how to do these things. Please teach me how to do this because I, I'm going to have to learn how to do this. But I appreciate you guys very much, very much. The title of the poem is called, OK, Boys, written on Friday, July 24th. And it's dedicated to the wall of moms. After the many things you've already had to stand and stare down for your children, a bunch of unmarked federal troops and camouflage and rental vans probably don't scare you. Moms can see right through all those helmets and dark glasses and know exactly what's behind them. Just a line of confused sons with guns. Whose mothers are at home wondering what kind of trouble they're up to now. Some sons confused by seeing you there. Some as to what their orders are. All by testosterone and adrenaline. Whatever it is they're not sure of, you appear to be considerably sure about. What it is that you're sure about. And we are grateful and in awe. So lock arms, ladies. We need you now as much as we always will. Namaste, everyone. Thank you so much. I appreciate it very much.
and Thank cheers you. again. Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> cheers. Yeah. <laughs> Always wonderful. I'm unmuting Jen right now, too. Unmute everybody. Okay. <laughs> everybody. All right. Nathan Brown, let's hear for Nathan. Thank you all. Yeah, I love it. Ooh, ooh, cousin. Ooh. <laughs> all right, Billy. <laughs> It's so great to have, see all your friends here, you know. The, yeah, yeah, Billy Brown, the cookie right. maestro. Yeah. yeah. I even <laughs> have one. I have one. I'm, I miss them, Billy. I, I miss your cookies. We uh, all miss Billy Brown's cookies. I know. I need some of those chocolate chili. Yeah. Chili oh. chocolate. Oh, man. <laughs> he owes us. Hey, I'm going to... Stop recording here in a minute, and I just want to add uh, that we're we're going to be uploading this to the the Playhouse YouTube channel. Before you <laughs> we actually uh, have one. Before, and, before yeah. you stop recording, mm -hmm. I had a question for Nathan. Okay. Nathan, do you have your um? Uh, are your fire pit series? I think that's on tomorrow. Uh, isn't it? I I yeah. Uh, I, I was trying to be sensitive to time and, and I, I didn't want to go over and John, I very much appreciate that. So one of the byproducts of the commissioned poem project, uh, which we're kind of calling the pandemic project unofficially, um, and the book series has been a Facebook live series called the fire pit sessions. We have actually filmed 45, uh, uh, 44 of these, if you can imagine. And uh, session 45 is tomorrow night. Um, and what it is, is it's basically a live reading. I do two to three poems and then close with a wonderful song. I'm gonna be doing a Patty Griffin song tomorrow night that I can't wait. I'm probably gonna cry while I'm singing it because it's just ridiculous. Uh, it's Patty Griffin's song, Mary. And these fire pit sessions have basically re-inspired and re-infused the commissioned poems project and the book project and they're all kind of feeding each other now but we are nearing 20,000 views um, on the uh, fire pit sessions which is wow. kind of shocking everyone <laughs> and I'm I'm just thrilled to death and it just seems to be they're about 10 to 15 minutes max these sessions and we also by the way if you go to my personal Facebook page they have all been uh, reposted there, and every single one of these fire pit sessions are there for those of you who are binge watchers. Uh, they're all there. And so. you have to see his fire pit. This is the Taj Mahal of fire pits. It, it, some people call it a work of art, and some people call it a problem. How many years did it take you? <laughs> I've been working on it, I don't know, th I, three to five years. My wife and I disagree on how long, but it's been uh, quite a while that I've been working on it and it has turned into quite a thing. And by the way, one of my big celebration moments when everything is over and we can finally gather again, we are having a big fire pit gathering for anyone who can make it from as far away as you are. And I'm gonna invite, we're gonna have a big party at the fire pit. We're there, we're there. All right. <laughs> All right, I want to uh, again uh, thank Nathan Brown and Hilda Roz. Can you unmute and give a nice round of applause to our future? Yay. Yay. <laughs> wow. Thanks so much for being here. And thanks to Hilda and Nathan. Nathan. Wonderful, Nathan. Thank you.